head of the Chicago mob, Tony Accardo, sits at the top of the country's most powerful criminal syndicate, the outfit. But now, he's facing his biggest challenge yet. After his second in command, acting boss Sam Giancana becomes a target of the federal government, drawing more unwanted attention to the organization. There's a degree of flamboyance to Sam Giancana, which in a way is bad for the outfit and bad for organized crime because they really like to fly under the radar. And Tony Accardo got upset with him. But just as tensions between the two mob kingpins reach a breaking point, one phone call changes everything. This is Sam. Joe Kennedy. What does he want? A sit down. What do you think he's after? I don't know. But if he wants to talk, I think we should hear what he has to say. All right. Set the meeting. Joseph P. Kennedy is a self-made businessman whose net worth is valued at an estimated $300 million, placing him among the top 20 richest people in America. Now, he's using his power to build a political dynasty. And he'll stop at nothing to make it happen. Well, what can we do for you? Well, this is a little unusual. The upcoming election. My son is running for office. I'm sure you've read about him. He's on all the magazine covers. John. John was born to be president. So what are we talking about here? What if I could use a little help from your organization? OK. We're listening. I understand that you have a lot of pull with the union vote in Illinois. Those uh, electoral votes could get him across the line. That could be the little push that could make all the difference. And why would we do that? <clears throat> no offense, but your other son's an asshole. Hey. No, no. No, it's fine. I'm aware of the trouble Robert has been causing you. Well, maybe I could do something about that. You deliver the union vote in Illinois for John, and I will make sure that Robert doesn't pose any more problems for you. We'll think about it. Fair enough. Joe Kennedy had connections to the outfit that ran very deep. And as far back as the 1920s, he was meeting and doing business with prominent bootleggers. And so Kennedy is reigniting his relationship with underworld figures in Chicago in anticipation of the election. President in our favor could solve a lot of problems. Yeah. And Robert Kennedy gone for good. Why not? Sam Giancana's latest assignment could
could get him back in good standing with Accardo. All he has to do is help John F. Kennedy get elected president. I remember guys were sent to all of us guys, and they said we had to get Kennedy in office. And I said, well, what's the vote for that guy, you know? Sam wants it done. If we get this Irishman in office, we got it made. Kennedy's campaign captures the imagination of the country. But as election day nears, his fight against Richard Nixon for the White House tightens, turning the outfit's home state of Illinois into a key battleground. In that 1960 election, Illinois was a critical state. Look how close these elections are, and they're decided by a county here and a county there. It throws the entire election off. Same guy. Check. So where do we stand? The votes uh, are still coming in, okay? Those union votes will come, I promise you. You see a peak, you will. You better not mess this up. I know. With the race so close, the winner isn't declared until the next day. We did it. Yeah. <gasps> Unbelievable. To us. To us. And the presidents. And now president. Good job. Did you just say something nice to me? Shut up. If you look at the numbers of that election, you could say that the outfit delivering those votes in Chicago were instrumental in getting Jack Kennedy elected president. For Gene Khanna, JFK's election is a huge triumph that proves the disgraced gangster still has something to offer and he wastes no time celebrating. Everybody drink, come on! That is good. <laughs> Sam Giancana is kind of a funny gangster. Um, he would boast about stealing the election for Kennedy. Woo! To me and us, and mainly the ladies. But just weeks after John F. Kennedy takes office, his brother Robert is named Attorney General. The face of organized crime has changed. Though crimes of violence still occur, the modern criminal has become more sophisticated about the planning and perpetration of his activities. And we are working very hard to develop a coordinated effort to curb the hoodlums and racketeers and put them in jail. The mob is outraged. They were angry about the fact that how could this be happening after what we did for the father, for Joe Kennedy? After months of failing to put a stop to Giancana, Robert F. Kennedy now has the power he needs to launch a full-scale investigation into the mobster.
the Chicago mob surprise. When Robert F. Kennedy takes office as the new U.S. Attorney General in 1961, he makes his top priority going after organized crime. And one of his primary targets is the outfit. Where do we stand in Vegas? Still nothing. Nevada's Attorney General has been unresponsive. And get him on the phone and tell him if Nevada won't cooperate, I will raid every one of their casinos. I will shut down gambling across the entire state if I have to. Yes, sir. And then in Chicago, how many agents do I have on the ground? Ten. Ten? No, I need 60 agents down there immediately. I want to know what Gene Connor and Akato are up to every second of the day. If those two buy a stick of gum, I want to know about it. Absolutely, sir. Good. It's an interesting question about why Robert Kennedy was so determined to go after the mafia. Robert Kennedy did see the world in black and white terms, much more than his brother. He sees going after organized crime as a justified mission and as a way of building his own fame and, and is launching his own political career. Good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Gentlemen. As Kennedy's investigation ramps up, he goes out of his way to target mob boss Sam Giancana. Hello? Hey, sweetheart. How are you? Missing you. Are you visiting soon? Yeah, I've been meaning to come out there as uh, soon as possible. How about Saturday? In time for dinner? Yeah, I'll take you to your favorite spot. Kennedy was willing to go after the mob uh, by any means necessary. A lot of it was done through surveillance and wiretaps that were unauthorized by law. Over the coming months, Giancana is followed everywhere he goes. Sam Giancana is being trailed by federal agents 24-7. They stake out his house. They're literally following him uh, on the golf course. This was, without question, harassment. Why aren't you eating? The FBI clearly knew that Gene Connor was fairly unstable. He was uh, prone to violent outbursts, getting very, very upset. So their strategy is to try and get to him by needling him in various ways. They're just trying to get a rise out of you. Don't give them the satisfaction. Sam? Something the matter? I catch you two snooping around me again, and I promise you it'll be the last time. Are you threatening a federal agent? joke no sir with the FBI tailing his every move Sam Giancana decides to hit back and sues the federal government 
for harassment. After being wiretapped by Robert F. Kennedy and tailed around the clock by the FBI, acting mob boss Sam Giancana makes an unprecedented move and files a lawsuit against the federal government. Mr. Giancana, the court finds in your favor. The court is adjourned. In the summer of 1963, a judge rules that the FBI has gone too far, ordering them to limit their surveillance on Giancana. As a private citizen, he's being harassed by these federal agents, so, you know, let me take him to court. He's got nothing to lose. He kicks in this lawsuit, and he wins. Prick. But Giancana's victory is short-lived. By suing the government, Giancana really put a target on his back in a way that was very reminiscent of Capone, I'm sure, for Accardo. Fed up with Giancana's antics, Tony Accardo calls a meeting with his co-boss, Paul Rica who's recently been released after serving 27 months in prison. First, he kidnaps Eddie Jones. I let it slide. Then he goes to the Tribune. I turn a blind eye. Now he sues the FBI. I'm done. If he carries on this way, he's gonna get us all busted. What do you suppose we do? We sell things. Permanent. All right. I won't get in the way. Well, in organized crime, you don't want to kill anybody you don't have to. But the Gene Connor lawsuit against the FBI is probably another straw on the camel's back. Paul Rica finally has enough. seven and a half with the gate open. Flush floors and big wide doors give you this kind of easy entrance. So simple to clean too. Just whisk out dust and dirt. From stem to stern, plenty of headroom, legroom, and seat width for, that's right, six passengers. And you can ride in comfort in any kind of weather with the top gate open. Complete ventilation, even when it rains. Do yourself a favor. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a bit of information. President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly shot by an assassin today in Dallas, Texas. We do not know officially at this moment as to whether the president is alive or dead. Before Rika and Ricardo can put their plan in motion, an event changes the course of history. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy, the man the outfit helped elect, is shot and killed in Dallas at the age of 46. After his brother is assassinated, Robert F. Kennedy steps down from his post as Attorney General. I would say no group benefited more 
from the assassination of John F. Kennedy than the outfit. Bobby Kennedy, as attorney general, had put tremendous resources into investigating and indicting organized crime figures. And those investigations dropped to almost nothing after uh, the assassination. But a new threat to the outfit soon emerges. When the government begins an investigation into Kennedy's assassination, with rumors already circulating that the mafia could have been involved. There are a lot of people who think organized crime had something to do with it. Was Lee Harvey Oswald a mob hitman? And here's Jack Ruby just coming in and shooting Lee Harvey Oswald on live television. How could this happen? Nobody knows, and I don't know that we ever will. With pressure on the mob intensifying, Accardo knows it's no time for a high-profile hit. So he has to come up with another way to get rid of his second-in-command for good. to see me. Sit down. <sighs> Take those stupid glasses off. Take them off. I'm gonna lay out what's gonna happen very clearly. And I don't wanna hear a word out of your mouth until I'm finished, at which point, the only words I wanna hear from you are yes, I understand. What the hell is this? What did I just say? After today, you're going to have nothing more to do with the organization. Immediately after you leave here, you're going to pack your bags for Mexico, and you're never coming back. You're really letting them do this? This is coming from both of us. Hey. Hey. You should be thankful you get to leave with your life. It's the best deal you're ever gonna get from me. The power of Accardo at that stage was so absolute, he really didn't have to kill Gincana. He could truly just push him aside, as far aside as Mexico. force Sam Giancana out of the organization. But even with Giancana gone, Accardo knows the feds won't stop coming after them. If Tony Accardo has learned anything from his mentor Al Capone, 
It's that a high profile in the mafia never pays off. And now, Accardo's determined to tie up loose ends before the government has a chance to take him down. Tony Accardo was very, very good at his chosen profession. He was very, very good at avoiding getting imprisoned. Uh, Carter was also good at insulating himself from things and therefore made it harder for the federal government to get at him. Gentlemen, good, good to afternoon. see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Take a seat, please. On March 27th, 1967, Accardo sells one of his top Vegas hotels, the Desert Inn, to eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes. Now, when Howard Hughes buys the DI, he's cashing out organized crime interests. They don't have the organizational responsibility. Now it's Hughes's problem. And they get a big influx of cash because Hughes had money. Accardo's deal with Hughes ushers in a new era in Las Vegas. Hughes ends up cashing out the outfit and other investors at the Sands. He ends up buying the Frontier Hotel, which always had connections to the outfit in Chicago. Then, in 1969, the Nevada Gaming Commission makes it legal for corporations to buy casinos. The Corporate Gaming Act is Nevada's effort to attract Wall Street capital. This is their chance to legitimize the industry. The outfit cashes out more of their casinos. And according to some, they walk away with an estimated $400 million in today's money. When the Chicago outfit exited Las Vegas at the time, they knew their time was coming to an end. They sold out for a good profit, they had their day, and they moved on. But shortly after the outfit cashes out of Vegas, Tony Accardo receives devastating news. On October 11th, 1972, his friend of 40 years, who served with him under Al Capone and helped create one of the most powerful crime organizations in the country, Paul Rica, dies of a heart attack. Paul Rica, his legacy was ushering in the reign of uh, Tony Accardo. He was someone who emulated a lot of corporate America. This was something he initiated, which uh, Accardo picked up. They were really looking at major businesses and how they were organized to determine how they would organize the mob here in Chicago. All the way to Rica, the boss of organized crime, in Chicago and in the United States. And the reason people don't hear about him is because he was a master criminal. And master criminals don't want to be heard about. Not long after Paul Rica's death, Tony Accardo gets more bad news. You're not going to like this. What is it? It's Giancana. He's back in town. Where it is, he's been talking with the feds. Thanks for letting me know. That prick. With nearly three decades worth of information on the outfit, Accardo knows that Giancana is not only a threat to him, but to the future of the entire Chicago Mafia.
After seven years of forced exile in Mexico, Sam Giancana, the number one threat to outfit boss Tony Accardo, is back in town. And word quickly gets out that he's talking to the feds. If Sam Giancana had walked into the FBI office and offered his services, it would have been a golden opportunity. He would have been a high enough ranking official. He would have been unheard of cooperation. Sam, you're in here. I'm cooking sausage. You want some? Yeah. How was Mexico? Mexico. You'd love it down there. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, but it's good to be back. I'm gonna make some new moves out here. Joe know about it? He won't like it. But he never liked anything I did anyway. You know, one thing I've learned, though. No one's gonna look out for you except for you. You know? June 19th, 1975, Sam Giancana is shot to death in the basement of his suburban home in Oak Park, Illinois, by an unknown assassin. One speculation is whoever came he knew personally, which would be natural, you know, because he was at risk at that point. He would not have let anybody in that house who didn't befriend him. Gian kind of strengths as a gangster was his ability to make money, his ability to use violence. His weaknesses were that the publicity that he garnered. He became just, just too hot to handle. Oh God! Oh God! He had to be removed because he just knew too much. To this day. Speculation surrounds Giancana's death. But for some, there's little doubt. Absolutely, Tony Accardo ordered the ultimate murder of Sam Giancana. You do not whack anybody out in that group without getting permission, plain and simple. services for Sam Giancana were held today, and John Drummond was there. Despite Giancana's status in the outfit, hand to pay their last respects. Outfit bigwigs were conspicuous by their absence at the services held at the month. Tony Accardo orders that no member of the Chicago outfit attend his funeral. Then, just over a month after Giancana's death, outspoken former outfit partner Jimmy Hoffa disappears. The same day he agreed to meet with two men connected to the mob. When Jimmy Hoffa was killed, my mother said they threw him in the Detroit River and nobody can survive that. Well, who killed Hoffa? It's pretty clear there are organized crime connections. And whoever did it, the Chicago outfit had to be OK with it.
Jimmy Hoffa's remains are never found. But many believe his disappearance is all part of Accardo's plan to tie up loose ends in the Mafia so that he can finally leave his life as a mob boss behind. In the wake of Al Capone's enormous success and spectacular downfall, only one outfit member from his era remains, his former bodyguard, Tony Accardo. Tony Cardo's legacy as a gangster, I would have to say, was probably one of the smoothest. I almost want to use the word unassuming, but if you knew Cardo, you knew what he was doing. To maintain a low profile, Accardo kept a job as a beer salesman for Foxhead Brewing Company, even filing income tax returns. But over the years, he also built a diverse business portfolio that included trucking companies, restaurants, coal and lumber operations, earning him an untold fortune. Look at this individual who had a sixth grade education and he becomes over the course of his 50-year reign of, of the mob an extremely sophisticated person who really took organized crime to a level that no other mob leader took it. Tony Accardo should be known to people as a true legend in organized crime. And he isn't, and I think he wanted it that way. In 1992, after a career in the mafia spanning nearly 70 years, the mob boss dies peacefully, surrounded by family. having never spent a day in prison. But while Accardo earns a reputation as one of the most powerful mafia kingpins ever, the outfit's success goes back to the early days of bootlegging, when Al Capone's mentor, Johnny Torrio, decided to structure the Chicago mob to run like a business. We'll be producing enough boots to supply every one of your joints for pennies on the dollar. Johnny Torrio, more than anybody else, invented the concept of organized crime and of syndicates and of lines of authority. Al Capone continued Torrio's methods, but also expanded the Italian gang's grip on the city by ruthlessly taking over territory. You need to hit him. Hit him hard. His hold on Chicago rackets, and eventually rackets beyond, was extraordinary. This is what happens. No, no. Maybe of all the gangsters that ever lived, Al Capone is the most famous. What made him stand out was a certain charisma, was a style that Al had. And he wasn't afraid to express himself vocally. Now, there's enough business here for all of us without killing each other in the streets like animals. And to be an outgoing guy, that combined with the historical record of what he did in terms of his violence and the way that he lived, it, it just makes him <laughs> memorable for all eternity. In the wake of Capone's success, Frank Nitti, Paul Rica, and Tony Accardo took what they learned from the Kingpin and expanded the outfit to become the largest organized crime group in America. This is a beautiful ledger sheet. In the process, Al Capone and the Chicago outfit changed the course of American history. We just got a president. New York gets the publicity. New York is the soap opera. But for most of the 20th century, Chicago and the leaders, who you don't even know, 
were the ones who ran things from one end to the other. The gambling industry, the movie industry. Always a pleasure. That was the genius of the outfit.